Standing about 180 feet tall over the front entrance to Epcot, you can find Spaceship Earth, a gigantic geodesic sphere that acts as the park's central icon, and also one of its oldest operating attractions. And inside, you can take a trip through time to see a story about the evolution of human communication in traditional Disney dark ride form. To this day, the ride is still a classic, and a real remnant of the park's original vision. So, with this two-part series on the evolution of Spaceship Earth, I really want to explore the origins of the ride, and how exactly it became what it is today. Part 1 will mostly be about the development process for the attraction, as the whole thing's got a long history of different themes, ideas, and influences all throughout its creation. Part 2 will then go into more detail on the changes it's seen post-opening, with various updates and whatnot. Full warning up front, things might get a little bit concept-heavy with this one, so I recommend at least having a general knowledge on the ride experience first, otherwise all this might not make a lot of sense. So, with all that being said, let's get started by taking the story of the ride all the way back to its beginning. As an idea, Spaceship Earth was first introduced back when Disney was coming up with concepts for Epcot's future world. While there was still a lot to be worked out in terms of what attractions exactly they'd be making for that section of the park, one thing was certain, they would all heavily feature themes of technology, industry, and innovation. And surprisingly, the initial idea for Spaceship Earth was created to almost contrast those themes in a way, by instead of going ahead and taking a look at our future, going back and taking a look at our past. And it was with that general idea that they started development, first bringing on science fiction writer Ray Bradbury as a consultant for the project. Bradbury can actually be credited with giving the attraction its name, based on the 1969 book by Buckminster Fuller, titled Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, which we'll be revisiting a little bit later. Leading up to Bradbury's involvement, Imagineers had decided that the attraction's core theme should be about humanity, and that it should also focus mainly on the history of mankind. So, with that in mind, Disney enlisted the help of various scholars and historians, most notably Fred Williams from the Annenberg School of Communication at USC, who would help them map out some various landmarks in human history, mainly to use as key points for the attraction's storyline from caveman days to ancient Rome and even the Renaissance. And it was in mapping out all these seemingly unrelated time periods that they found a connection between all of them, a theme that could let them link all these historic vignettes together in one big fluid story, the story of communication. By assuming that the ability to communicate is what really advanced us as a species, the attraction could use that theme as a through line for human history letting them visit different time periods to touch on stuff like the early development of language, the origins of civilization, as well as how technology allowed information to become widespread, all of which leading to modern day and the future that we envision because of it. Not only was it a great way to tackle the ride's pre-existing theme of humanity's history, but it also worked as a perfect transition into the rest of Future World, letting Spaceship Earth truly act as the park's introductory pavilion, which also coincided with its official placement up at the very front of the park, almost like a prelude to Epcot itself. Now with a general sense of what time period Spaceship Earth would touch on, its themes, and how they should relate back to Epcot as a whole, Ray Bradbury wrote the first version of the attraction's script in 1977, entitled Man and His Spaceship Earth. This version wasn't really meant to be an actual outline of the ride itself, but rather a kind of concept layout for the project, where they could illustrate some of the ideas they wanted to show throughout it. And because of that, we can get a pretty good idea of what they were imagining early on. Before the script even gets started, you can find two specific quotes right at the top of it, both of which describe Earth as it appears from space, as a very small and fragile thing. And this kind of idea takes us back to Buckminster Fuller. In his 1969 book that originally created the term Spaceship Earth, Fuller really evokes imagery of Earth as just that, a large spaceship that we're all on. And by relating the planet to a mechanical object, it brings up the concept of maintenance, and the fact that all of us on this Spaceship Earth have got to play an active role in its continued existence. 
Granted, that is the abridged version of what the book illustrates, but it's obvious that Bradbury took a lot of inspiration from those ideas. And because of that, Fuller's fingerprints are all over the concepts you're going to find throughout this script. But he actually takes it a step further, expanding on the ride's theme of communication by linking those two ideas together, explaining that a big part of our continued existence with the Earth is communication between its inhabitants, and more importantly, the sharing of information between them. Basically, if we could learn to communicate with each other effectively in the past, we could also use that ability to spread relevant information that either benefited the species or our societies. A pattern that you'll see a lot of throughout the attraction storyline. Communication leads to information, information leads to survival, and survival leads to the advancement of the species, along with all the fruits that that bears. And they even go so far as to say that we can actually use that collective understanding to create a real operating manual for Spaceship Earth one day. Once again, going back to the spaceship and crew analogy. So, all in all, that was the kind of thematic makeup of Spaceship Earth as an attraction. A mixture of humanity's history, as told through the story of communication, but with smaller themes of information thrown in there as well, all of which coming together to try and illustrate some of the ideals within Fuller's book. Really, there was a very unique mix of different themes running through this thing, and for the most part, they all pretty much stayed the same throughout the rest of its development, as from this point on, Imagineers were mostly working out the logistics of the attraction itself. Now, as for what they actually had at this point in terms of a real, tangible attraction experience, you might be surprised at how much was already figured out this early in the project. So, we're going to be taking a look at Spaceship Earth, as it was described in Bradbury's 1977 script. I'll mostly just be condensing much longer descriptions into a couple of sentences, and throwing some extra lines on screen here and there for additional details. So, let's get into it. Much like the final version of the ride, this one still starts off at the very beginning of our human evolution, with a scene involving Cro-Magnon Man fighting off a woolly mammoth. This is meant to represent our early ability to communicate with each other, followed by the tribes that we formed because of it our first sort of proto-society. And owing to that, we as a species could not only survive, but live long enough to record our experiences, and then later share that information with newer generations. Of course, they were just in the form of cave paintings, but it was still a step towards retaining and archiving information. Which leads us into our next scene, Ancient Egypt, meant to symbolize one of the first real societies based on that same kind of communication that we just saw, only now a little more evolved, advancing with the creation of a language and hieroglyphic symbols, both of which were used to aid the documentation and preservation of that society's knowledge. And that then transitions into the Phoenicians, who, in their hunt for new lands and trade opportunities, ended up spreading these new ideas and information between all the world's different societies, unintentionally connecting people on a global level. Something that continued throughout the rest of this part of the attraction too, as an explosion of information would continually spread across the world through the newest means of that era. Whether it was written works in ancient times, printed materials throughout the Renaissance, or even through new technology like telegrams and telephones in the early 20th century, the continued theme was that spreading of information which is actually one of the three main points that the whole experience was broken up into, something else that was explained within the script. So far we've covered both the recording and dissemination of info, but the third and final part was the processing of it, which was probably one of the most interesting. If you're already familiar with the ride as it exists today, you've likely already recognized most of the scenes I just talked about, including other stuff like the Industrial Revolution and the early 1900s both of which were also brought up in the script. But this version has a little bit of a different ending. As we exit the dissemination section of the ride, there would have been a sequence that bombarded the rider with information, symbolizing the overabundance that the world now has access to. And the solution they envisioned was through computers, which have the power to sort out and organize all those facts better than any human can. This was then followed up by a pretty interesting sequence, that would have taken you inside a computer, 
to see a kind of abstract interpretation of its inner workings. In what they described as a psychedelic experience of swirling colors and patterns, all while hearing all those same facts being sorted out. This is really one of the many cut effects and sequences that you can find within this version of the script. Another pretty neat one I saw were these little transitional scenes between some of the different time periods, like the one between the cavemen and ancient Egypt, for example, where they mention having these walls of data appear to symbolize our collective archiving of information, which then morph into hieroglyphics as you enter into the next scene. Other cutscenes include a medieval battle that would have taken place after the Phoenicians, something that was eventually switched out with both the Greek and Roman scenes that appear in the final version. But probably the biggest lost sequence you can find within this script has got to be right at the beginning, with a very long and elaborate introduction into the attraction. Immediately after loading, you would have entered into a darkened room and started to see an effect where faces seem to appear out of mists and vapors, before dissolving into each other and back into the darkness, all while hearing tons of different historical figures' voices fading in and out at the same time, ranging from Martin Luther King Jr. and Teddy Roosevelt to Hitler and Gandhi. Eventually, all these different voices merge together to become the Universal Man, who will narrate our upcoming journey through time, starting off by taking us back to the very beginning of it, where we sit in the black nothingness before existence. It then goes on to describe a big explosion, representing the creation of the universe. And as we move through space, passing by other planets and nebulas, we eventually land on Earth, being greeted there by the dinosaurs, now at a time even before men. Obviously, this whole experience was cut from the final ride, and they ended up just starting it off with the cavemen scene that would have followed it. We'll talk a bit more about how exactly they plan to do all that and why it was scrapped in a minute. But first, let's jump back to the ending real quick and finish up this version of the ride. After the computer sequence, the big finale would have featured a launch that took you into space, almost sort of mirroring that initial visit we would have taken through it at the beginning, but now representing our journey in it as explorers, even likening us to Columbus or Lewis and Clark, really bringing the whole thing full circle and illustrating how it was made possible through our own societal evolution. It then shifts the focus back to Earth, now from thousands of miles away, once again conjuring up the imagery we saw back at the start of the script with those two quotes, trying to almost convey that same message subconsciously of Earth as our own little spaceship. And finally, we begin our descent back down to it, as our narrator, the Universal Man, challenges us to actually work on building a better future. This is where you can really see some of those themes that we were talking about earlier, even with a couple of references to Fuller's work directly. All things considered, it's actually pretty interesting just how much of the final ride was already thought up this early in the project. But I should note that at this point, it was really all just words on paper. I mean, even the concept art that I was just showing had still yet to be created from that script. So, keeping Bradbury's story outline in mind, Disney finally got to work on designing the actual ride, which, as always, started off with a piece of concept art. Just by looking at it, you might notice a certain sci-fi kind of element to this old design. And it's no coincidence, as the original look of the ride was also thought up by Ray Bradbury. To have the attraction, or at least some portion of it, inside of a large geodesic dome, and while that might seem like a strange choice of show buildings, there actually was a deeper meaning behind it, as the design was based on a similar looking structure from the US's exhibit in Montreal's Expo 67, one of the most popular world's fairs in history. So, the choice for reusing the dome as Spaceship Earth's exterior can really be thought of as a symbolic one, since early Epcot was specifically meant to function as a permanent world's fair. But, it actually goes even deeper than that, as that exact same geodesic dome from Montreal was originally designed by Buckminster Fuller. Like I said earlier, Bradbury took a lot of inspiration from Fuller's work. And not too long after the new exterior was decided on, Imagineers got to work on translating those pre-existing script scenes into an actual scale model for the attraction around 1978. 
Just by zooming in and taking a closer look at certain parts of it, you can actually find most of the same scenes we just talked about, including stuff like the big prehistoric scene with the dinosaurs, the cavemen scene right after it, and both the Phoenicians and Greeks following that, with the ride's big space finale, of course taking place inside the dome itself. But right in the middle of working out all the specific details for this model, a second wave of story rewrites were created, and show designers prepared to adapt all those changes into the old model. Probably one of the biggest problems with that first version was the fact that it stuck so closely to Bradbury's original script. And while that script was a great outline for the attraction storyline, it still glanced over certain parts of it that they would have needed to balance out an actual ride experience, with scenes like the Industrial Revolution and 20th Century only really being quick mentions in that script, not real descriptions that they could actually translate into the model. And this is where the Imagineers come in, now reorganizing all of those looser ideas from Bradbury and fitting them more tightly in that same narrative, also expanding on the old scenes by adding in some new vignettes, like Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel in the Renaissance section, or setting the Industrial Revolution scene in post-Civil War America, just to give it a bit more historical context. But right around the same time of all these new, smaller scene additions, Disney came up with one of the biggest and most drastic changes in the ride's entire development. That being the decision to fully put the ride inside of a geodesic sphere, instead of the original dome. This idea came from the sense that, since the attraction had a theme of building upon history to get where we are now, riders should continually be going up as they were on it. However, the decision did bring with it some new challenges. The first of which being the fact that the original model was now completely nullified not leaving much point in adding any of those new scenes they had just been working on, prompting Disney to once again reconfigure the entire layout in a new model, mainly so it could all fit in that type of building. And this is what led to that kind of winding staircase design that you can see in this model, where all of the scenes would now be built on that spiral platform. And this also led to the removal of scenes that they deemed unnecessary, like the dinosaurs and Big Bang portion that I mentioned earlier. Another big change was the official use of an Omnimover for the ride system. Originally, they had wanted to have smaller groups of ride vehicles going through the attraction on their own, but with the new limited track space that they were now dealing with, Omnimovers were just the only way to up the ride's capacity to a decent number. As work continued on designing the new geodesic sphere and the rest of the ride inside it, Disney began looking for a company to sponsor the attraction mainly just to offset some of the construction costs behind such a big project, which they eventually found in The Bell System, a telephone company from the 1980s, really a perfect sponsor for an attraction all about communication. Now with just about everything else for the attraction set in place, they began to wrap up all of its loose ends, stuff like some of the overlooked transitions between a couple of the ride scenes, a new script for the narration, and also a different entrance to the ride, now directly underneath the gigantic sphere, which, of course, wouldn't be complete without the famous mural by Claudio Mazzoli, who also created all of the concept art for Spaceship Earth 2. And as all the various scene set pieces, animatronic figures, and even the clothes they wore were created, construction was already underway for the building itself over at the park. In order to make Spaceship Earth's all-new geodesic sphere a reality, Disney engineers worked with Simpson Gumperts and Hager Incorporated, the same company that actually worked with Fuller on the original Expo 67 dome. In essence, the new design for the sphere was basically just one of their old domes, sitting on top of a steel square ring attached to the pavilion's legs, making it seem like the whole thing is just one big ball, instead of two separate parts. And once the main structure was built, they also created the winding platform that the ride would be on inside of it, then subsequently covered the entire thing in a black rubbery waterproof material to protect the attraction show scenes from the elements. Then, that whole layer was covered up by a second sphere that they would end up putting the famous Alucaban pyramid tiles on for decoration, finally giving Spaceship Earth its signature look. Meanwhile, inside the sphere, they were busy installing the ride's tracks, scenes, and animatronic figures throughout early 1982, 
eventually wrapping up later that year and officially opening the attraction on October 1st, along with the rest of the park. Now, obviously, there's a whole lot more to be discussed about Spaceship Earth, as this only marks the halfway point in its story. We've still got years worth of changes to dive into post-opening, and also some older concepts to revisit, but that'll all just have to be a story for part two. <laughs>